Oh, hello. I hope everybody is here. I, I'm Neil Snape. I'm here to talk about doing images, making images, and the importance of having a good monitor. I don't know how I can tell if anybody's actually here. Can somebody put in chat and send me a message to say you can hear me? Yes, no? <laughs> okay, great. So I'm just showing some slides of uh, some of the previous work that I've done. I'm a professional photographer, and now I've turned to mostly, uh, mostly teaching. And I still have my studio. I not only rent my studio, but I also give private lessons and do a lot of workshops. A couple of really good workshops coming up in the, in the near future. I give some private lessons on uh, using Lightroom and Capture One, both. And recently, I've actually even gone on to help uh, BenQ and Xrite in uh, Perry Photo, which is a fantastic experience. So, what I want to talk about today is the importance of having a good monitor. Now, I'm really a great supporter of BenQ because of what they've done to, to bring great monitors to the marketplace with a price point that nobody else has even ever tried. So what they did is they made um, quality monitors on par with any of the, the big names, and yet they put a price point on it so that everybody can afford one. And with your images, the most important thing, with the change of time, you're likely going to buy new cameras all the time, especially the, um, the camera bodies themselves, new lenses, and other things that you're going to make pictures with. But over time, what you have is images that are currently in progress and ones that you've made in the past. As we move on with technologies, we we can improve the way that we process the images, but the only way that you can know what's in an image is to have a quality monitor that you can fully rely on. So BenQ brings that to you for a price point that nobody else can, can beat. So I strongly recommend you look at uh, BenQ monitors. I've never found anything that's better and I'm just in love with what they do in every way. So I've got two monitors that are BenQ. I have the 27 inch um, SW2700, which is a 27 inch HD monitor. That's ideal for doing photography. If you wanna go a little bit further, then if you wanna do 4K video, then you'd, you'd wanna get the um, a 4K monitor. They have both the 27 inch, and I'm lucky enough to have the 32 inch. The 32 inches just gives you just a little bit more room to, to work on your images and have uh, palettes open. Now, I've got a two monitor system and my computer is actually a screen in itself. So I have the iMac 27 inch uh, 5K, which is a good monitor, but it's not as good as a, a matte screen uh, BenQ. So if you're gonna do retouching or looking at images all the time or video, uh, editing, a matte screen is what you really want to look at. And not only that, you need a monitor that has uh, hardware calibration and 14-bit um, depth in the way it does error correction for the monitor itself. So all of those things are made possible with all of the BenQ monitors, and that's really what you have to have. So the quality is the monitor, of course, the IPS uh, for the viewing angle. You have to have Adobe RGB for the color space that it can actually provide all of the colors within that space so that you can have um, the base of your images uh, correctly presented in front of you. So they have all of that and much more. But today's webinar is not necessarily only about uh, talking about BenQ monitors, but also um, about how to make signature images, how to edit your images, how to uh, select images, and what makes an image strong. So today we're gonna go through um, a few images and we're actually gonna edit them in real time. 
in Lightroom. Now, I could do them in Capture One, but I've become more accustomed to using Lightroom because of its abilities to easily um, do round tripping between Photoshop and back into the, uh, the same folder. And then the edited version comes into Lightroom automatically. So there are some advantages to using Lightroom. Um, that's one of them. And I've just become very, uh, well, very familiar with uh, using Lightroom for my everyday work. When I edit images, I don't spend very much time in Photoshop. I spend most of my time in Lightroom. Now, selecting images is another story. So let's, let's get started. If you have any questions, please use, there's a, a question box in your uh, menu or chat. And you can ask anything you want about photography in general, BenQ monitors, x uh whatever you like, photography. It's all up to you. And at the end of uh, today's webinar, we're going to have a 15-minute uh, uh, question and answer period. So I will get to any questions that you post. Let's take a look at this. We're just going to quick time player. Now, since we started off with I made just in Lightroom. I hope that everybody can see the um, the display. Since normally I work with a dual screen um, setup, so I have my vignettes or the small images on the left, and all the the menus are on the left. And I I work with my BenQ monitors on the right. So the actual edited image, even though in the developed settings, I'm using the, um, the iMac, but I need to have that just, I have to be more sure of what's being displayed on the images on the monitor that's on the right, which is my BenQ. I work between both monitors, so I do use the 32 inch uh, 4K, but I also like the, uh, the 27 inch, especially for stills images. So I'm always a little bit torn between both because I like them both that much that I can never decide which one. Today I have the 32 inch plugged in and maybe tomorrow I might plug in the 27 inch again. When I'm doing video though, I always use the uh, the 4K monitor just because uh, it has a little bit more resolution and it's a larger screen. So you have more surface area to uh, to leave the pallets and the, um, the rotoscopes open. Okay, let's get to how to select images. Now I already pre-selected some images. When I shoot, I shoot fairly quickly and I shoot a lot of different setups. What I'm always looking for is the unexpected image that's in between the takes. Now I know that I've already made some good pictures, but what I'm looking for is that one that's maybe that I didn't expect to happen. So I shoot a lot of images really fast. It's not because I didn't already have a good image, it's because I'm looking for that maybe the little glimpse in the eye it's a little bit better or different. Now, how do I select images? I start off by giving them one star, and then I, I do a, a filter. Now, your filter selections are down at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that. And you can do your, you can do your sort by the number of stars. Now, I've already selected, it, it, it's a sticky menu, so it actually took in the last time I used it was three stars. If I set it to one star or above, then it's going to show everything that's here. So what I'll do is I'll go through the images. And although you can't see it because it's a dual screen, on my right, I have the full size image. And on the left, I have my um, the vignettes. I don't select the images by the vignettes. I only select them on the full screen version. Now, if you want to use a dual screen, and I highly suggest that you do, if you use a, a portable, you just plug in a second monitor into uh, the cables that are supplied with a BenQ monitor or whatever method you have to use. You'll notice on Lightroom, there are two different um, numbers on the bottom. Those are your screen numbers. You can even have multiple screens more than that if you really want to. And in the other monitor, you can actually choose what is shown on the other monitor. So you can lock it, you can do different things. I usually just leave it on a default, which is loop view, so I can see a big screen image. Now, what I do, so I'm gonna go through these. I have my fingers on the keyboard. Uh, one, two, 
and X so I can reject images. So I'll just keep going through them and I might see one that I missed before. And you can see that why is there two copies of the same image? That's because the agency picked the image on the raw image. I made a, a web HTML gallery. I sent the, the images that were the selects, three stars and above. They said they wanted this image, this image, this image. So I gave them green colors. So I did a sort by color. And then I did the edits. I edited first on the raw images in Lightroom. I did as much as I possibly could in Lightroom. And then I went to Photoshop just to remove things like maybe a, a pimple or a little problem in the skin or maybe a line or something that was not permanent, but I could remove. Because the agencies don't want you to um, modify things that are permanent. Like if, if a girl has a scar and the agency, they don't want you to take that out because when they go to see the clients for castings, if the pictures show that she doesn't have a scar and she shows up and she, had, she has a scar that they didn't see, then it's a, a fault for the agency. So the agencies don't like a lot of retouching for the images that are supplied to them if you're gonna do test pictures for models. Now, so you just go through them and you select them and you give them stars. And if say this one you really liked because it's kind of a funky little picture, I can make it bigger by pressing the, uh, the space bar and you can say, okay, maybe the agency really liked that. I'll give it three stars. So you can see, make sure you can press it again to go 100% view. And you say, okay, and you can go back to the grid, press G, back to grid, fine. So now I give given it three stars. Let's say that I've gone through all of the image, given the ones that I think are worth three stars, then you just go up in the number of stars and it's there's a the little tiny sign. Everything Adobe did in Lightroom is frustrating, but it's very small. Why they did that is just because they probably have shares in optician companies trying to sell you stronger glasses and you can select if it's rating is greater or equal to, et cetera. So I have it greater or equal to. Now it's selected everything that's three stars and above. You'll notice that it has the copies that are both the raw and the edited image in there. That's the way it's done when you do round tripping into Photoshop in Lightroom, which is really fantastic. So what we're gonna do today, because our image that we had on the cover for today's webinar is actually this image. So I'm gonna make it bigger even though I can see it on the BenQ, but you can't see that from here. So I'm going to just press the space bar and it's going to take it to fit view. This is the PSD image and right beside it is the raw. So you're going to see what I did to it when I switched between the both. Now, the easiest way for you to see side by side what was going on is I'm going to go back to, well, I'm already there. So I'm going to select both like this and I'm going to press C for compare, which is one of the little icons that's at the bottom. You can see the ones X to Y. These are your different views. You have grid view, loop view, compare and survey and another one I never use. So I don't even know why it's in there people, but that's probably if you're using telephones and doing other things like that. Now you can see that there's not, a lot of difference between both. So she had a little bit of a sleepy eye. So what I did in Photoshop is I took in a lightness, light, um, yeah, I think it's light, light mode. So I took a tiny little area that's in here. I made a selection and I slid that over on to the other side to make the eye just so that it appeared brighter. Now, it's not a big detail, but it's a little detail. How do you make Image is great, even though they're already good. It's attention to the little details like that. So you can see that I slid that onto the other side, onto this side, and I changed. Maybe I took out a couple little wrinkles. So I didn't wipe out all of the information that's underneath her eye, but I smoothed it out in also with a stamp in lightness mode. And that is done faster in Photoshop than Lightroom. Lightroom, you can definitely lighten things, but it's not made for changing pixels. It's made for 
changing densities overall and reflecting your taste in the image there. You can also see that I smoothed out the, the lines in the skin. I didn't completely remove them, they're still there, but I lightened them as well with, again, with the stamp and lighten mode. I'll show you how I do that in a little while, but we're gonna go on with actually creating one. Now, how did I get from the raw to there? Well, I started off with, I'm gonna go back to grid mode. They're still both selected, and I'm going to go, and I'm, we're gonna go through this together. So, I have my image. If I double click, it's still, it's gonna change it to fit, but it's still in the library mode. In the library mode, we can actually apply develop presets. If you right click, you can go all the way down. You can find your own happiness in develop presets. You can apply these presets in, um, where did all my presets go? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply any um, presets that you want that are in here. And I'm a little bit confused because they're not there. Okay, that's new. So we're going to go to develop mode. So you can press D or click on the on the top. And I'm going to go back to reset. So I'm going to reset all because this one was actually copied and I started to play with it. Reset all. There's the base image. Now, if you want to see how far I got from the original, I'll press C again. Now you can see the difference between how much you can do on an image in Lightroom or Capture One from a RAW. So the camera, it saw this. And to give it a signature, I did everything that I needed to do directly in, um, in Lightroom before ever opening a Photoshop. Photoshop really is just for the last little details that it's faster to do it in Photoshop than in Lightroom. Lightroom, you can do some clone, you can do some heal, same thing with Capture One, but neither are very efficient at doing that. So when it comes down to moving pixels around, like pimples or hair or anything else, that's best done in Photoshop. So let's go back to Grid View, except we're gonna, I'm gonna open this one. Now, press D, and we're gonna start to do this. So. What is it about this image that might be a little bit better? Well, you never know. This image is basically daylight. But in my studio, it depends on the day, of course, and anybody's studio is gonna depend on the day for the color, temperature of the, uh, the light. Now, if you have a monitor that's calibrated, the BenQ works very well with uh, all of them you can download their proprietary application. It's called Palette Master, which works with the monitor directly in communication. It's going to save a 14-bit uh, lookup table inside of the screen so that the computer itself with a video card, it doesn't have to do much work to send the information with an almost linear um, curve so that the computer itself, the video card, doesn't have to do much work in correction. All of that is done behind in the screen. That's why there's a big difference between even the quality of the iMac 5K, which is a very good screen, and a BenQ monitor, which is running at 14-bit and 10-bit of workflow. So it's sending out more information than the iMac can is set up to use. So you have finer graduations and a lot better tones that are gonna come out in the monitor that you can actually see the difference that you cannot see. There will be things that are hidden even in a in a quality monitor like an iMac uh, 5K. It's a very important uh, topic. It you can go on for hours talking about the differences, the nuances. I just want to tell you that having a 14-bit lookup table that's embedded into the monitor itself makes for an excellent workflow that's very reliable and. Believe me, you really do rely on that quality of the image that's in front of you. So let's get on to how we're gonna do this one. So usually what I do in Lightroom is I start to play with the sliders, and the first thing I always look at is temperature. 
why temperature? Well, if you're going to shoot with daylight or continuous lights, the temperatures might be different. And since I'm shooting my picture inside a studio and there's double pane glass, there's the light that comes through the glass is usually a little bit green because it's double pane glass. So usually what I do first is I add a little bit of tint. Now it depends how much, it depends on the color of the daylight that's behind, if they're clouds, not clouds. So I start there and you can see that by default, so if I double click on that, it'll go back to plus five, which we shot at. You can see it's a little bit green. Maybe you can't see it's a little bit green because this is a webinar. But if you have a calibrated monitor, especially of NQ, it's calibrated with an X-Rite i1 uh, display or i1 Pro, or in the near future, that'll be i1 Studio as well. You will actually see the difference of the color. Very subtle differences, but important differences. So how are you going to make your pictures better and really good images? Well, have a good monitor and calibrate it. So I'm going to add just a little bit of magenta into the tint because the daylight that that day was uh, it's a little bit green sometimes it's a, a lot more green it really depends on the day on the day itself i can make it a little bit warmer as well because she's it's, i can make it a little bit warmer but uh, you can see that by making it warmer we also we're going to change it to a little bit too yellow so how are we going to correct for the yellow yeah we're going to actually add some color back into it. So I'm going to take this one out. I might even double click on it. Go back and so that it doesn't go too yellow. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, what else can I do to it? Well, exposure. I can see if it looks better, lighter, and she looks a little bit pale when it goes too light. Now, some cultural countries, they might prefer pale. I like a little bit more texture, so I'm actually going to take the exposure down a little bit so I can bring out some freckles. Yeah, might be around there. I'm not sure. Um, contrast, you can see if it looks better or worse. Yeah, it's about right there. Now, the other ones, highlight and shadow. I go down in the, in the, um, in the menus, starting at the top, going towards the bottom. There's a logic in that in Lightroom. The developers, when they did that, they did it that for a reason. It's not by accident that they have these in this order. So highlights are actually what are um, the edges of the information that are in the image. And so it's where the clipping is going to occur. In this image, there are no real whites that are clipping out. So you can move it to anywhere you want. But to keep a little bit more detail, I might do that, and I might uh, check and see whites. Ah, that looks a little bit brighter. I might even take my highlights up a little bit. Okay, that's good. Shadows, not sure. I'm just moving around. But I like a little bit more contrast, so blacks, yeah, I'm definitely going to take them down a little bit. You'll notice that the blue in the shirt if you can see that, it's actually going to go towards the black, and I'm probably going to change the contrast a little bit later. All of that's looking good. Now, clarity. Clarity is a scary slider. We don't want to add too much clarity because it actually makes people's skin look really, really bad. And when I was starting with Lightroom, I think it was more than 10 years ago, um, well, clarity was a bad thing, but a lot of people added too much. Everybody's images look like HDR. Not a good idea. Dehaze is something they've added in the most recent versions of uh, CC. It's um, it's not really made to do skin tones, but believe me, it sometimes it has a good effect. In this case, we're not going to do it. But what you'll find is sometimes images they actually look better when you take the saturation and vibrance down. Vibrance is mid tone or light area like pastel saturations. And saturation is overall when you have extremities. So I'm just going to take it down a little bit. And that's looking pretty good. Now, if you want to go into the next slider, we're just going to see what happens. And you can see how you can break up the image if you put in too much highlight, even though before I took it down. If you go this way, it goes really kind of funky. So 
We're probably not going to do that. I'm just taking a look at this. Okay. So this one I might go up a little bit higher, make it a little bit brighter. Take the lights down to give it a bit more contrast. Ah, that's looking good. Okay. One thing is we have to, we're going to make it a little bit, take the shadows up so we're not going to drop any colors. You can watch in the histogram as well. I can drive, drag the slide over. The black in the background has no information. That's fine. That's okay. That's all there is to it. So sometimes, or most of the time, I actually use these set points. Now these are where the control sets that are below, where they're going to affect the image. So you can actually move those out so it only affects the very highest of highlights. In this case it's not too much. And in the shadows you can see that it does change a little bit. So I usually adjust those as well so that the amount of these sliders affects certain specified zones. Now if we go back into color, which is the important Part of this image as well and you could say you know, I could start anywhere now skin tones are almost always composed of reds oranges and yellows so I'm gonna start off in the in the reds and unless you've made some type of error if you've added some color gels or something it's not often you want to change the hue angles of the uh, of the colors in the image, not too much, but you could definitely can change the saturation. So if you want to play with this, and you can make your you can give a rosier cheeks by changing the saturation up a little bit, and you can change the lightness, and you can see it's going to change a lot. So usually I find the reds affect the lips the most. So if I take the luminous way down, you can see where they are. So that's the way. I actually work in Lightroom as I take the sliders and I hack them one way or the other way and then I can tell where they are. I'm not going to let go of the mouse, I actually hold on to it, I just want to find out where they are. There are other ways to do this in Lightroom, you can use um, HSL and you can use the target to pick up the colors underneath the cursor at the time, but I, I'm not going to do that this time. I'm actually going to change the lightness up so to make your lips a little bit brighter. Now. Oranges. I could do the same thing and I can find oranges. Now you can see that would be really, really, really bad. You won't want to do that. But this way I can see where are the oranges in the image. So underneath. And you wouldn't want to do that either because then it should be really pasty. But you can take it up a fair bit to make your a little bit brighter. I even take up the saturation. Good. I'm looking good now. Yellows, same thing. I can see where the yellows are. Ah, so there's the key. So you can see that the yellows with blonde hair, they actually live in the hair more than the skin tones. So I can change this all I want. It changed a little bit in the skin tones. Around the neck and the top of the forehead, but not that much, but it makes a big difference for the hair. Now, the key to that one is how much saturation you want. You can say, okay, all the rest, if you wanted to find in blues, she's got a blue shirt. I can see, yes, there's a little bit. It doesn't really matter to me because the emphasis is on her face. So all of the rest of this is fine. There's a little trick that I use. And if you're not sure of where you're going, let's say, I think it looks good now, but before I change anything else, let's see if I can make a little picture of this. And it's called a snapshot. The shortcut is Command N, or you can find it, right click on it, or find it in the menus. Command N, and I'm going to make a snapshot. That way, rather than going back steps of history, I can actually click on that snapshot, which is created here, and I'll go directly back to the current state at which it was made into the snapshot. A very useful way of saving uh, what you think is good at the time before you destroy it by moving something around and finding out it wasn't as near as good like half an hour later. So one of the things I do for a lot of my images when I do color images is I use split toning. Why? Because I still shoot on Canon and Canon don't have a very good transition into shadows. So what I do is 
usually since I'm shooting models is I like to have the transitions into the darkest areas and I like to add a little bit of red into that. Now you could say, well, you don't really need to do that if you use Capture One because the color, um, the way that it transforms colors are more performant than Lightroom. And yes, that's very true. And yet it's actually the CMOS sensors in Canon cameras that don't have very good shadow uh, transitions. So what I do is I, I add color. So now the way you find out, by default, split toning, I'll just go back a step, split toning has zero color added. You can actually turn it on and off with a little box, which you can hardly see. But actually you take the saturation, you turn it into, uh, somebody called it a Warhol effect the other day. I won't say who that was. And this is the way that you add a lot of color into the image. Now, you wouldn't want to do that unless you want special effects. It's to find out what color you're adding. So in this case, by default, it's the hue sliders way out at zero. And what I do is I take that back into, I'm going to take this down a bit because it's a bit ridiculous. Now, if you go to green, you can add green into your skin tones. Again, you must have a calibrated monitor. Otherwise, how would you know what colors you're actually playing with? You have to have a reliable calibrated monitor to make this possible. So, and so I don't want to make her too red because then it makes her look sunburned. So I'm going to take it towards when it just starts to go golden color. That's a little bit too far. And I'll bring it back just a little bit into the reds. And then I'll take my saturation slider, turn it back to zero, and just pull it in just until there's just enough. And we'll go a little bit further. That looks about right to me. Now, there's a balance slider, which means, do I want those colors to be towards all the shadows or just towards highlights? Well, if I want it to be a little bit less in the shadows, I just can turn that up to there. Now, I didn't add any color into the highlights yet. So if I do this, it's going to look really ugly again, but that's to know what color am I actually adding. So into the highlights to counteract the orange that I put into the image, I'm actually going to turn this to a sort of blue, towards a blue, not too, too blue. Maybe it's somewhere around there. And I'll take this back to a very low number of saturation. So just to counteract just a little bit that, orange that I've added, I'm actually going to pull back in a little bit of blue. You can barely see it. That's about right. Yeah. Looks pretty good to me. I hope it does to you. Are there any questions? I can see a question there. So you shoot a lot of redheads, ginger models. When converting to black and white, do you emphasize the freckles? Yes, I do. Um, I'm a big fan of freckles. I never get enough of shooting freckles. When I was a kid, I had freckles. Then they all disappeared. And yet somehow I'm attracted to these freckles that sometimes don't exist. How do you do that? I actually have a brush, and I can brush over an area I don't know how I figure out to save this as a preset brush, but it actually is called freckles and it actually emphasizes freckles on, on those. Uh, when you change it to black and white, we're gonna do a black and white image very shortly and we'll go through some of those steps and maybe we'll pick a girl that has freckles and we'll try to emphasize them. So where were we? We're just checking in split Tony to make sure everything's good. Yeah. I think that looks pretty good. If I put in a lot of color, then I have to add more color in the other one. That's about all there is to it. So we can go back now to basic, and we could say, I'm gonna just double check everything 
Yeah, I think it was good there. Make it brighter, dark, a little bit darker, so we have a little bit more freckles. Maybe it looks a little tiniest, tiniest bit too orange. So I'm going to actually pull the um, color temperature back a little bit, just a bit. I think we're we're about right. I'll go back to split toning. I'm actually going to take out a little bit of that saturation. Yeah. So we've done everything that there is to do in the actual setup here. If I do another snapshot, I can actually toggle between the last one I made and now the finished image. You can make as many snapshots as you like. So we're going to go off to the brush tool. How do I make the images look the way I do in Lightroom? Well, it's really easy, actually. So I can go up to one-to-one -one view angle or reproduction size. And most often, I actually go to two-to-one. That's when you have a high-resolution monitor like the 4K BenQ or a 5K, a 5K uh, iMac. Now, what I usually, my signature is in the eyes. I love eyes. So I have these presets. They're already done. And I'm going to roll this down to iris, dodge, and exposure. Now my brush size, I use a magic mouse so I can actually change the size just with the middle scroll. And it's set to 70. The shortcuts are the same as for Photoshop. So if I press nine, that means 90% flow or zero could be 100. I usually leave it at 90. It's a soft edge brush, 100%. And I just draw on the image like this. If you want to see the mask, there is a button at the bottom, show selected mask, or the shortcut is O for mask, show mask. Toggle it off again, like that. Now, what else is there to do to this image? Well, let's go back to here and see what we can do with it. Now, I'm going to click on new, and I'm going to go to, now I'll show you the manual method, exposure. The last used setting I used was 0.12. So I'm actually going to draw in naturally occurring where the light was down here. I always find that the light falls off from the top of the head to the bottom. So I draw in this a little bit. Sometimes there's if there's a little bit more light there, and I will highlight that. But in this case, it's going to be falsely manipulating densities. So I'm not going to actually do it on this side. I might do it on this side a little bit. That's good. Now. What else can I do? I could do it here, make it a little bit lighter as well. I could do it bottom of the eyes. If you want to see where the mask is, I'll turn it on for you. So that's where I put the mask. That's just exposure. That's not the other pin. The other pin is this one. I'll turn it back off again. And we're going to do the opposite direction now. We're going to actually take this into uh, exposure again. But this time, we'll take it down a little bit. So down the exposure, I could actually use contrast as well. And to just emphasize just a little bit I don't know why it didn't go down. I'll find out later. And anyways, so wherever you see that there's actual shadows, so I draw that in. Sometimes to give more um, depth actually just underneath shadow and there I went too far because you can see I made it darker so if you press option it's actually a race so I'm going to just race a little bit of the mass there and it was set to 30 percent so I want to go a little bit faster so I'm going to set it to 90 just nine I'll race that and I think we're looking good and um, I'm just going to make this a little bit darker and at the top of the head you can see there that's about it I think we're looking pretty darn good. That's about all there is you have to do the image before you send it into Photoshop, except for I'm going to add one more brush tool, which is Hair Dodge. And if you see the numbers, it's exposure a little bit more, contrast a little less, highlights a little more, and clarity a little bit more. And actually, it will stroke in over where the highlights exist in the image.
to make it more lively. So it's not cheating, it's not retouching. It's only it's doing exactly what you would do in a, in a dark room. You can see that it's a little bit um, light there, so I'm gonna add one more, and I'm gonna go to another one. I have, it's called Skin Smooth, and I'll just see if that makes that a little bit smoother, a little bit less bright. So that's negative clarity and negative um, uh, sharpness. So I have little things. Oh yeah, freckles, why not? We're here. So I have one, it's called freckles. Let's see if it actually does anything. We'll make it bigger. If it doesn't do what we want, well, we're just gonna delete it. The pin, if you press the backspace key, it'll disappear. So on the, on the right side, didn't work out very well, so I'm actually going to erase that portion of it, and the rest I'm going to leave. And if you want to make our eyes a little bit brighter, remember we made a pin there. Well, go up there and change the temperature down a little bit more. Take out the yellow just a bit, and that's too much. Minus six. I think we've done a great job. I think that's about all there is to doing this image. That you need to do. It's different every time I do it. It's different. It's not really repeatable. It's how I feel that day and how I'm looking at the image. Now, unfortunately, I had to do this this time watching this screen, which is the iMac, and I really prefer to see on the on the BenQ because I have confidence in the BenQ and I don't have confidence in iMac. And iMac, I regularly calibrate it, but it's nowhere near the same quality as the other one. Okay, let's. Uh, there was a good question there. Do you use a Macbeth uh, chart in the shoot? Macbeth chart, yes. Uh, it actually was uh, Munsell Macbeth that did this chart a long time ago. And uh, I do use them, and I think they're a great tool, especially for video. It makes it so much easier to do uh, fashion shoots. Do you need it for doing this? The advantage of using a color checker passport chart is not so much to have accurate colors or precise colors coming in on beauty images, but it's important to get the maximum amount of colors out of your camera, out of the capture that you can. Because what the chart is designed to do is actually to pull the maximum, the extremities of the color and align them that they go in the right direction. So when you make a profile, a DNG profile, for Lightroom, it's fully automated. You just export it and create the profile. When you bring in your images, you can actually apply that um, color calibration. Now they've moved it up into the first um, the first menu, which is up here. It's profile, and they have a menu which is a browser, and you can apply different types of presets. And one of the presets will be your newly created uh, profile. So it's not so much for color correction, but it's to get maximize the colors that are coming off your camera. There are a lot of blues that by they come into your, say for Canon cameras, I can't say for other cameras, that the blues are, are weak and they're not that good. The reds are not, not extremely good with uh, Canon with Adobe software. They can be different in Capture One. And what it does is it creates a profile for your sensor so that when you bring it in, you have the maximum potential of colors that align to your sensor. So that's the advantage of using a, a Macbeth. You don't have to use it for every shoot. If you use similar lighting conditions, once you've made one profile, then that should be good for that particular camera under that lighting condition. So you don't have to do it for every beauty shoot. If you use flash, you should make one profile for flash. <clears throat> And if you use daylight, then you should make one for daylight or continuous light, whatever you might have. Okay, so that we don't go too far past, let's go on to make a, a black and white image. And I'm not gonna go in here. And somebody said that they liked this one. Ah. So how am I going to do this one? I'm going to show you before and after. And there's not much done at all. So almost everything was done in, in uh, on the raw. So the raw is on the left, 
and on the right is PSD. PSD was just to take out a little bit of bumps underneath the eyes, uh, a little bit rougher, rougher skin. There might have been a hair or something in front. And take a look up close. Yeah, so it's just a little bit of the texture here. That's a lot faster to do in in Photoshop than it is to do in, uh, if at all possible, in Lightroom. So let's go on to actually making this image. So I'm going to go back to the original. I'll go back to grid, not compare, uh, deselect <clears throat> the other one. So this one, I'll command apostrophe, which is make a virtual copy. And we'll press D for develop module. And I will just reset it like that. Now, my presets, I think they, I don't know they're there. OK. Now, I have a ton of badly named presets. I could roll over top of these, and that's what I usually do. I don't know why. It's kind of like hope and pray that something neat will come out. But I have these really weird, funky presets. If anybody's interested in them, on my website, you can sign up and you get a bunch of free ones for free. And I can also, also if you give me an email, I can give you a bunch more if you really want. Now, let's go off and let's make this into a black and white. So how do you do black and white? You press V or click on the black and white, and I'll change it to that. Black and white's a little bit different than doing color. So the first thing I do, it's still in a logical order, but the first thing I do is I play, I hack. I hack as much as I can into uh, color temperature. Often, I find a lot of my images, not all, but a lot, um, when the color temperature is way down around 2000 or 2300, it actually works out well. Then I take tint. I keep changing this until I find something that I like that when it comes alive. What I like about both Capture One and Lightroom is that it's completely visual. So you just play until your heart's content. Maybe even a little bit more uh, Lightroom. I think it's it's a visual playground. So I'm just going to keep changing. Say, hmm, when's it going to be good? Well, when her face comes alive, when that skin tone just pops, OK? Then I'm going to change overall brightness. But I don't want to make her pasty. I like that, the density. I say, OK. Here's where it's going to change. I'm not going to bother changing many of these yet because the highlights and the whites, the darks, they're going to change faster with my black and white settings. So I start here again, and I just start hacking. So there are no reds. I can leave that anywhere I want. There are no oranges, because I set both of the sliders. Ah, but there we're starting to see something in yellows. So I'm going to go back and double click on the word black and white mix. That takes me back to zero. And then you can see yellows actually do play into it. But I don't want to make our lips like they're breaking up. So I'm not going to change that one much. Greens. Now there are greens. You can see there's a lot. So if we want to increase the uh, the detail, we can actually take the greens down a little bit. Ah, so you can go the opposite direction to aqua if you want the sky brighter, or you can make it darker. But when you make it darker, our eyes go dead. So I don't think so. We're going to go actually lighter this time. That's what I like about doing this, it's never two times that I'll do it the same. You can see that there's still some blues. We're going to go up there. And not much in purples, magentas. Everything's good. Now, I'm going to go back to where I was before. And this time, you're going to see a bigger change and faster because I've already pre done what I think is interesting. So and I'm just looking at her face, finding out where, where it becomes really interesting. And I think it's around there. Now I'm going to go down to highlights, change them a little bit. It's good. You can see how fast you, once you get used to doing this. So shadows, I put them up a little bit. This one, I can leave it there. Clarity this time will make a difference. Ah, but you don't want to make her crunchy like that. So clarity, I can take it up just a tiny as a bit. And we're done, except for what I do by habit. I'm trying to do this really quickly so I can get some question and answer period, which is coming up very shortly. So I'm, first thing I'm going to do is what I always do, is I use my preset for iris, dodge, and burn. It's just a bunch of numbers. 
and you save it out as a personalized, customized uh, brush tool. And you give it a name. It makes sense. Start brushing the eyes. Yeah, I take it back. You can go either to one to one or even or let's go back and do what we did last time exposure up a little bit for the areas that have light i'm doing this with a mouse by the way i also have a wacom tablet and i can easily use that which i do sometimes and now that it just depends how it, i want to shape the image this time there is a little bit of light on this side she's got a very strong face it's wonderful everything's good there um, now we're going to go the other direction we're going to go exposure down just a bit uh, not to do too much because she's got very strong features and this is really hard light take down that little highlight on the side shape that one okay, need to do that too much I'm going to go back to exposure and go up because I noticed her other side of her face is a little bit dark. Take that one up. And only one last thing to do before we get to the question and answer. We're going to go to whites. I'm going to take the whites down in this area. Now, I could use auto mask, but we don't have time, so I'm just going to do that. Take that down because there's too much emphasis there. And maybe take down density and contrasts. A lot more you can really contrast to make it lighter and take the white stuff. One last thing because I just can't not do it. Hair dodge. You can see we can make the hair come alive. And that's all there is to it to making a great black and white image. You can see that you can easily do great images inside of Lightroom or Capture One course and all you need to do is visually play and the only way that you can do that correctly is to have a calibrated monitor highly recommend BenQ take a look at everything they have now we have a period for a question and answer thanks for listening so maximize to maximize color you might think you would expose to the right Yes and no. Um, the the problem the problem on the with exposure. So probably the least performant cameras are uh, Canon cameras. They hate overexposure, and they don't like they don't have shadow separation in uh, in shadows. So. If you underexpose too far, you have no separation. And if you overexpose at all with Canon, you have horrible fringing and color skin tones. So if anything with, with Canon, you really need to underexpose if you have any bright areas of skin, if you wanna maintain that detail. So my style is to maintain a maximum of detail in the skin. I like the reality of it, but some people don't like that. So it's really a personal choice. I hope that answered that question correctly. Okay, other question. When you shoot, do you have in mind the edits you'll be doing in advance? Uh, that one just popped up. Um, setting lights for reflectors, etc. cetera. Yes, um, yes, no. What I like about shooting in RAW is the simple fact that you can modify to your heart's content after the fact. When you when I used to shoot film, you decided which film to use for the pictures, what type of development, if you had to push, pull, overexpose, and the signature was actually already embedded into that film by your choice of development, choice of the film, etc. With RAW, it's it's almost unlimited what you can modify and how you can modify it. So when I do my pictures I know that I can't overexpose if I want to maintain like a high level of skin tone so I already know that I will shoot a certain way for to make editing possible to actually bring out tones so if anything I underexpose for that hope that answered that question do you set Lightroom sharpening to zero before um, exporting to Photoshop um, sharpening 
I actually have it set for all images importing with my Canon camera to reduce the size of the radius to 0 0.6 pixels and usually a little bit lesser amount. Sharpening is a another topic that you can really talk about for a long, long time. Sharpening should be done on destination uh, sharpening and it shouldn't be done on the originals. The originals you should only bring it back to as real as it should be without uh, um, artifacts or halo haloing around uh, around points. So that's why it's um, you want to set it to a little bit less for Canon cameras, but it can be different with different cameras. Okay, so how far are you away from exactly? That's a very good question. It's um, an important question. How far are you from uh, the bigger monitors? Uh, I could actually measure it, but I think it's around. 80 centimeters, so almost almost a meter from the 32 inch. It's a comfort zone. I like that. And if you're going to do video editing, I think the 32 inch monitor is more practical because the 27 inch, you're going to be a lot closer. I know it's only a difference of diagonal of four, well, uh, five inches, but 27 inch, you're going to be a lot closer. For video, video editing, I think a 32 inch is really, really nice. And I think for stills images, 27 inches more than enough to do. Uh, do BenQ monitors have to have their hardware calibration um, bypassed to work with X-Rite i1 profiler? No, it's uh, it's actually the uh, BenQ has. You have to download it. It's not actually. It's included. It, when you buy the monitor and anybody can download it, it'll only work with BenQ monitor and it's actually hardware communication with uh, with your computer. And it accepts, of course, X-Rite, so i1 Display and i1 Pro, and soon, soon I hope I can say that, will be the i1 Studio, which is a spectral phot photometer as well. It also accepts uh, data color four and five. Um, you, you don't need to bypass it, and actually, I think you really should be using that as an application. Some people have said they have problems with them. I've not had any problems at all with it. It's really simple, and it's just a better way because when I have to calibrate for the i1, uh, sorry, the iMac, it's um, the quality of the calibration with the same um, colorimeter, which is the i1 display. Pro, which I really like, it's extremely fast. The the quality of the calibration is not as good. It's not the fault of X-Rite or the the i1 display. It's because the monitor itself is driven at uh, eight bits per channel, and the lookup table is then um, is the same. So it's it's not as accurate. So the the corrections for the um, the actual panel itself are not as fine as what you'll have with BenQ monitors. It doesn't matter which BenQ monitors for the photo or video line; they all have the uh, the same application, and they all can be calibrated in the same same way. Do you use auto white balance in camera, or is, no? I actually leave my camera set to uh, daylight color, even when I use flash, and then since I shoot raw, it's not really a problem. Do I change it in Lightroom or Capture One? Yes, um, that's the advantage of shooting raw. It's really important though when you do video to do a white balance in your camera because video is usually compressed unless you have an enormous amount of storage and you actually can shoot raw, but very few people do. That's really important. So what else do we have? Last question as we're running late. Yes, what question? Is there another one? I'm just taking a look through the questions. Are there any more questions? Of course, you can always um, email me. It's neil at neilsafe.com. Uh, you can go on my site and you can sign up for the mailing list. In the future, I'd really like to do a lot more uh, YouTube videos on how to do this, uh, more webinars, more contact with the public. Does the corrected 
Let's load automatically the monitor. Uh, yes, it does. It's fully automated and the communication is really, really, really nice. There are absolutely no errors in between the communication between your computer and the monitor. I use Macs. It's, um, in theory, it should work perfectly well on PC as well. Okay, so I want to say thank you to everybody that uh, came and joined and hope that you continue with your great pictures and sharing that passion that we all have. Bye now.